want to introduce uh, Nadi Bramer. She is a freelance data visualization designer, and uh, she's basically a self-taught, a, a graduated astronomer turned into data scientist turned into self-taught data visualization specialist. And now, if I'm not mistaken, you're focusing on uniquely crafted data visualizations. Is that right, Nadi? Yeah, yeah, custom stuff. Uh, I don't have much trouble saying no to something that seems, um, you know, that I don't think will be fun, but say no to something that seems awesome, I'm really bad at. And that's why I've had a to-do list where it's personal projects besides my laptop, it's like it's literally here. Uh, since December of 2014, uh, when I first discovered my passion for data, I do scratch things off every now and then. Uh, this is, this hasn't been, like, it's not this one exactly since 2014. Um, but new items appear just as fast. But it, actually, in hindsight, I don't mind this permanent lack of having uh, no time left to actually get bored. I feel like my personal projects have given me opportunities that I didn't even know I was looking for. Uh, and this will play a really big role in me being able to pursue a freelance career about three years later. Uh, and my favorite personal project is the one, uh, the one I want to share with you today. Uh, it was a year-long, year-plus-long collaboration that I did together with Shirley Wu, who was a, a speaker at last year's event. Uh, and uh, well, she's like me also a database freelancer, but she's based in San Francisco and I'm right outside of Amsterdam. Uh, so to set the scene for what I'm going to talk about, a bit of background. Uh, so Shirley and me first met uh, virtually in a database Slack channel before meeting in real life uh, a few months later at OpenVizCom, where we both had the honor to speak. Uh, and we really hit it off during those three days. And then a few weeks later, I was publishing tutorials about the different aspects of my talk. And uh, Shirley really jumped on them and started asking me all kinds of questions. Uh, and somewhere during those talks, she, uh, we, we started lamenting the fact that we hadn't created as many more advanced data visualizations in the last year. Um, so suddenly, Shirley, out of the blue, asks me, well, do you want to collaborate and create stuff? Uh, and I think it took me like five seconds to reply with an all capital yes, uh, and that's how Data Sketches was born. So in the following week, we figured out that we both liked the idea where we would create a visualization each month around a specific topic and do that for a year uh, to see how two people would start from the same seed, the topic, but then diverge into different paths based on our own interests and history. Uh, well, besides sharing the end result, we also wanted to talk about the, uh, write about the creation process. And we split that up into the three pillars that we find most important, data, sketching, and coding. And initially, we thought we could pull data sketches out with about five to six hours a week. But uh, as usual, real life really doesn't care about plans, especially coding plans, I find. So it took way, way, way more time to actually finish all these 12 projects. Uh, and during this uh, short talk, I want to take you through some of the lessons that I learned, challenges faced, and insights gathered along the way. So to start off with the most fundamental aspect of uh, data visualization, the data itself. And if people used to ask us really like, uh, so where did you find that data? Uh, but it's not the data that guides us. It's really the topic of each month that provides a spark of an idea, uh, some sort of insight that we might want to reveal, and then how we could visualize that. And only once we have that more concrete angle do we investigate to see if, um, if we can find some appropriate data. Uh, for example, for November, the topic was books, pretty broad. But I really wanted to focus on fantasy books, and more specifically, the themes and titles of fantasy books. Uh, and so once I have this sort of more concrete angle, I do nothing more special than just Google the web using that concrete angle, combined with the words data or data set, and then having the patience to click on every link in the first two or three pages of results. Uh, and this has led me to Google spreadsheets containing thousands of Olympic medal winners and wonderfully unique data sets, such as one in a GitHub repo about all of the words spoken in the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, or even one about a family tree of 3,000 people connected to European uh, royal houses going back more than a millennia. Uh, I also learned that website design really doesn't say anything about the quality of the data it shares. So you kind of have to look through that. Uh, well, there are also websites that have structured information, but not in some ready to download format. So I have to scrape the logical layout of the website and then put the information that I want into a file with the help of some code. 
Uh, for example, IMDb has an advanced search that returns a list of movies, and I, uh, each of these movies is contained within uh, a set of divs and other elements. So I can download the HTML off the page and then use some code to look for everything that follows a very specific styling. I mean, all the movie titles could be contained within uh, a div of class title. Uh, and for that books project, I actually used the uh, Amazon most popular fantasy authors uh, to get scrape a list of the 100 best-selling fantasy authors. Uh, there are also APIs for which you can request information that I have to admit I do often use these uh, because they can be such a hassle to set up. Nevertheless, sometimes the wealth of information is just too good to ignore, um, so I really have to. Uh, for example, with that uh, list of 100 fantasy authors, I then used the Goodreads API to get the uh, information on the top 10 most rated books of each author. So gathering info on uh, the number of ratings, the average rating, and of course the titles of all of these books. And uh, I mean, I can all go on and on, on on these things, but even like manually getting your data together is totally fine. Uh, for example, for our nostalgia month, I uh, dove back into Dragon Ball Z, and I'll, I'll get back to the visual in a bit. Uh, but I was uh, looking through the Dragon Ball wiki pages, and I found these lists of all of the battles, uh, all of the fights that occurred during um, during the anime and uh, it was I thought so I basically I thought it would be very interesting to visualize the fights in an in a anime that rolls around fighting so I just copy and pasted all of these lists into Excel and with the help of some of Excel's simple functions split them apart into the different characters and so on and it took me about two hours to get the data ready for these 200 fights which I know it was way faster than if I tried to, to write a scraper that would handle all the nuances in this list. So the lesson that I want to convey here is that um, they, there are so many different ways to find data. It's not just hardcore data analysts that have these skills. Data can be found. You, you know, you have, you have the straightforward spreadsheets, but you can also scrape it, have APIs. You can ask other people uh, and even just create it manually. But it's good to realize that. Um, no matter the data that you find, probably like 99% of the cases, you will have to do some sort of uh, data analysis or data cleaning and preparing it in a way that will actually is needed to visualize the data. Uh, so to get a little bit into what kind of um, data cleaning that could be, for August, the obvious theme was the Olympics uh, because we were uh, we are both big fans. And I ended up visualizing all 5,000 gold medal winners since the very first games uh, in 1896. So each of these circles is a group of similar sports. We have uh, water sports over here and ball sports over there. And then within that, each of these circles has sports, uh, the feathers in a way, it's called Olympic feathers. So we have athletics over here. Um, we have the first edition in the center and then going outward to later editions. Um, we have female events on the reddish background and then male events in the bluish background. And finally, each medal itself is colored according to the continent in which the country lies that won the medal. So Europe is blue and um, uh, Africa is red, sorry, America is red and Africa is black, uh, and so on. And I kind of like, I never knew, I only realized when I was in this project that tug of war used to be an official Olympic sport. And I'm kind of sad that we don't have like national tug of war teams anymore. Um, but I've actually, I found the data for this piece from two articles that were published by The Guardian for the 2012 Games in London. However, after I got a rough shape of the visual on my screen, I noticed that some very obvious medals were missing, such as um, hockey in 2012. So suddenly my confidence in this data set dropped drastically, and I needed to get a sense of the accuracy and completeness of the data. But I did not want to have to manually check all of these 5,000 medals, so I found a proxy instead. Um, on Wikipedia, I can find lists that tell me the number of events that occurred during each edition, which I then compare to the number of gold medals I have in my data set. And if there is a discrepancy between these two, then I would investigate further to figure out where and why. Uh, so that's how I found out that for some of the editions, the horses were also in the data set which made for an interesting read to suddenly see names such as Princess and Sissy and Lady Mirka as women winning gold in the Olympics. They were pretty easy to uh, spot. And there are a few more of these sort of odd things in there. And eventually I made changes and, and got it to the point where I trusted it again. So lesson here was that, I guess I keep on learning this lesson, but you really need to get a sense of accuracy and completeness of your data. Uh, missing data can be harder to find than wrong data. 
So think about taking uh, sums and counts and averages and comparing that to either plain common sense uh, or even better, a different data source. So Shirley may have also filled many pages of our notebooks with sketches because they help us think and lay out ideas beforehand. And my sketches are often very simple. I really only focus on the main abstract shape that I want to uh, fit my data into. Now, colors and layouts and details, these are things I only vaguely think about but don't act on until I have the data on my screen. And that's because it generally, there's no time, let's not it. It's like, it's not useful to think about these things until you've figured out that the data actually works once you've morphed that into that main shape because data has its own mind. Um, for example, for the Olympics piece, I was actually inspired for um, the design when I saw a peacock feather with a symmetry uh, and then having greater emphasis on the later editions. But I had no idea if that would work all right once I finally placed 5,000 metals together. So I really had to get a see and how, see how it would look before moving on. Um, it did take a few steps to get the code working in the right way. Uh, but once I had the final version on my screen, uh, this one, I saw I could actually see insights and learn things from this. So I was like, okay, so now I can actually continue and think about other design stuff and layout stuff. And other things I try and think about during the sketching phase though, is uh, how to add extra details. So how to create more context around the main information that I want to convey. Uh, and for example, the Olympics piece is already pretty high density of data, but I couldn't resist adding information about the Olympic and world records because every athlete there tries to bring at least the former, if not the latter. Uh, so I added a small white dot on an, a medal if it had resulted in a currently standing record, such as Usain Bolt's 200 meter dash here in Beijing. And a way for me to think about adding extra details is to think about the visual channels that I still have available after uh, I have my main chart standing. Uh, so let me explain that with another example as well. So for all, um, I think it's already been 20 years. Now, um, during exactly one week in the year, more than half of the Netherlands listens to the same radio station. And I know um, we're a small country here, but it's still pretty unique. Uh, nevertheless, this happens during the final week in the year when the top 2000 songs are aired counting down to the new year. It's quite a thing for a Dutch person. So I asked Shirley if our topic for December could be music so I could tackle these 2000 songs. And I wanted to visualize um, what decade was most popular in terms of song release year. So here is how the visual, sort of the base of the visual came to be. So each of these circles is a song. And the bigger they are, the higher the position in the top 2000. And the darker the color, the higher the position it reached in the weekly top 40s at that time. Uh, and then they are clustered to sit at their uh, year of release from the 60s until today. So we can see that the 70s and 80s are really the most popular decades. Uh, and then something went wrong in the zeros and they were slowly picking back up again. Um, but it felt that there was so much more information in this data set. We had artist names and bands and, and the songs and we could do, I could do other stuff. And also the, the visual seemed a little bit too boring still. So I, I wanted to expand on that. And in this case, I considered the visual channels I still had free and I chose to use uh, a stroke, a colored stroke, uh, adding colored marks on top and using textual annotations to highlight very specific things. Uh, and here is a sketch that um, kind of highlights some of these idea and, and how that could look. Um, and sadly, in, in 2016, uh, David Bowie and Prince died. So that was pretty clear that I wanted to highlight all of their songs in the top 2000 and explain with text like how it had changed with respect to the previous year. But I could also use the rankings if of the songs in different ways. For example, I could highlight all of the songs from the most popular artist or band, which was the Beatles, or highlight the, um, the, the highest newcomer from 2016 or the highest riser or the generally highest newcomer or just single out that Pokemon song. Uh, that was the year of Pokemon. Uh, or even just to highlight the top 10 songs better by adding these extra marks on top. And by adding all these extra things, I felt that the visual could be more fully understood, enjoyed, and it just made it for a visually more pleasing result as well. So again, the lesson is that even if you have your main chart standing, try and think about how you can add extra details, how you can use remaining visual channels to add extra variables that can supply context for the truly interested reader to understand even more about the main point that you're trying to make. 
So as expected, though, most of our hours were spent on actually programming our visualizations. And here are two of my perhaps less obvious coding lessons. Um, so for the very first month, the topic was movies. And I knew pretty early on I wanted to do something with The Lord of the Rings, which is my favorite trilogy. And I thought that with the popularity of the movies, uh, there would be loads of data found online, which did not turn out to be true at all. However, there was one true gem of a data set. Somebody had created a data set that contained the number of words spoken by each character in each scene of all three extended editions of The Lord of the Rings. I mean, I thought that was bloody amazing, and I knew I had to visualize it somehow. So I started thinking about, like, what would I want to visualize? I thought, well, I would be interested to know how many words has each member of the fellowship spoken at the different locations throughout the movie. And maybe or maybe not, you can, I'm not sure if you can read it, but this data set actually has no location information. So together with the scripts that I could find online and my memory of having seen the movies way too often, uh, I took a lovely Sunday inside and just manually added in location information to the 800 fellowship rows. Like it's a dedication that data sketches required. Uh, and I started sketching some ideas, and I quickly came upon one where the uh, members of the fellowship would be in the center, the location spread around in a circle, and then the, the thickness of these sort of strings connecting these two would, would convey the number of words spoken by that character at that location. However, this chart form didn't exist. At least I didn't know of any tool that could make it for me. But it reminded me of a chart that did exist, called a chord diagram. So I thought, well, maybe somehow I can start from the chord diagram and transform it into my sketch. So here is a basic a stripped of all text chord diagram. Uh, and I thought for me, well, the most fundamental step is to make these chords or strings flow towards the center. If I cannot make that work, it's not going to happen. Uh, thankfully, though, that somehow it doesn't usually go this way, but that took less time than anticipated. I got working, so then I felt like, okay, we're, we're in the clear, we can go on. Uh, so I removed this, this space, some uh, recalculations, and now it could actually handle the Lord of the Rings data uh, and some more appropriate color palettes. And we have nine members of the fellowship, so I had to make sure that um, sort of the, the center, that the, 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 the strings would line up at the right place. But this was looking way too squished, so I had to make some sort of adjustment to my original design and just kind of pull these two halves apart. Uh, but now I wasn't really liking how the top and bottom were looking. The strings were looking rather unnatural. And that's when I finally de decided to learn how to create SVG shapes. So I create all of these visualizations using D3.js. Um, and D3 generally creates SVGs. Um, and so I finally des decided to learn, like, how, how can I create SVGs? And how can I ma sort of manipulate these shapes? which was the thing that took the longest in this project, by the way, lear learning that. Um, but that was the final step and how all this came together and how this sort of core diagram slowly mutated into my new chart form in a way. Uh, and there's also some light interaction because there's a lot of strings going on here. So again, lesson is that, um, you know, many people have done amazing stuff uh, and, and then they share, lots of them share like ways of how we're creating it, if not like the actual code. Uh, so even if you think you are making something new, that doesn't mean you have to start from scratch. Just try and find a way, uh, the thing that most closely resembles your design and see if you can adjust that um, uh, to what you want. You know, work, work on the shoulders of other giants that have already thought really hard on how to make that thing work well. And there's actually nothing that I learned more about during data sketches than these SVG uh, paths and how they are connected to a whole new world of creativity, such as something as simple as using curved lines instead of straight lines in a network. Uh, this one is actually about the European royal family to these sweeping arcs in my visualization about fantasy books to these feather tips that I really created for the Olympic feathers project, but that never made it to the final result. Um, the where it started all with the Olympics, not the Olympics, uh, with the Lord of the Rings ones, where I learned it all, and even these sort of really running lines I don't quite know how to name. And another project that revolved heavily around these custom SVG paths had to do with our nostalgia month. And I decided to dive back into something that I've been crazy about uh, since during my teens, uh, Dragon Ball Z. So um, if you sadly don't know Dragon Ball Z, it's an anime that revolves around fighting. Uh, so it seemed quite fitting to create a visualization around all of the fights that happen. 
Um, it's running a bit slow. It's not supposed to be this slow, but maybe it's the screen sharing part of it all. Uh, but anyway, it's, you can see all of the fights are happening from top to bottom. Uh, and then uh, we can see things about the fights. We can see if we hover over something, it probably go really, really slow. Come on, yes, <laughs> we can see who fought whom. And if there was anything special about like the forms they were in, like at some point we'll start seeing Super Saiyans here, here, somewhere over there. Um, so it's really, you know, I help people all sort of a fun way of looking at this, uh, this anime. Uh, and the base of the visualization was this, just these fights from top to bottom and from left to right are the different sagas, which you can see as story arcs or seasons in a way. Um, and then to more easily follow a, a specific character from fight to fight, I, um, I wanted to connect all of their fights by a line. And I did this by using so-called quadratic Bezier curves, which give you the option to pull on a line by moving hidden anchor points. And I decided to pull harder if the distance between two fights was farther apart. And then somebody gave me advice to use the side of a fight to denote good guys versus bad guys. So we can see here for Vegeta that he started out as the main bad guy before uh, moving around a bit and, and finally mostly becoming one of the good guys. Uh, so introducing all the other characters and this actually taught me things about the, uh, the series that I never realized before. Uh, but I just wasn't liking the single thickness lines. Uh, it wasn't quite conveying the dynamic nature of the fights. So instead I wanted to create a shape that I could fill with a color uh, which would mimic a, a stroke of varying thickness. And in these cases, what I usually do is I just take a notebook and I sketch out my desired end state and then try and deconstruct it in terms of its mathematical or in this case, S3D path elements, uh, which here basically came down to flipping the path back up again using different amounts of swoosh, I don't know how to call them. Um, and with that kind of small change, I felt that the visual was a lot more, again, visually pleasing to look at more dynamic. So even though I've been talking about uh, SVG paths for this because they are so important for my uh, particular database work, the general lesson here really is that uh, re to really, really try and embrace the advanced functionalities of whatever tool it is that you are using most um, if you want to go beyond the basic examples. So I, I was using D3 for two or three years, uh, like daily before I finally took it upon myself to learn how D3 creates these SVGs for me. And once I kind of learned that as well, I could still work together with D3, but it opened up such a world for me in terms of possibilities and creativity that I wish I'd done that sooner. Anyway, I have loads of more lessons, but I guess we're through. So <laughs> I've learned so many things like, you know, uh, that you can find data in the weirdest places, that it's not blasphemy to pre-calculate visual variables, that sketching can help weed out thinking errors, but that you can also sketch with code. That SVG paths are amazing and math is amazing, but I, I sort of already knew that part. Uh, or that surprisingly small things can add a sense of delight to an audience. Uh, and we didn't set out to be you know, confronted by these things. We just wanted to have fun, and in that we definitely succeeded. Uh, and even though the year, that year, you know, it's been 2016 and 17 already, um, it still took me a whole year to finish the last two projects, and surely only finished recently. Uh, and that's because um, during the projects, we became freelancers, and then it was just too much. And we also wanted to do bigger, bigger, bigger things, and it became just too much. Uh, but we eventually, we made it. Um, and if you are interested at all in learning more about the data, munging, and uh, sketching, and coding up our, our topics into often, you know, weird and overly elaborate visualizations, you're in luck. <laughs> Shameless plug. Uh, we have we have created uh, a book about this, uh, which will come out at, uh, in October, I believe. <laughs> so uh, finally, thank you very much for your attention. That was great. That was amazing. Your visuals, oh my goodness, they're beautiful. <laughs> they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, I think we had a question here, Alexandra, if you want to. Yeah, we have a question from Mateo, who also equally liked your impressive visualizations. Um, he asked if you uh, use uh, wikidvpedia.org. Um, I feel like I've come across it, but it's not, I, I don't have like very specific data sources that I go back to. I really literally just go to a, um, uh, to Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever I'm in the fancy for the time. Uh, 
put in like topic plus data and then see what it brings back. And sometimes it brings me to Wikipedia or any of its other associates. And sometimes it brings me to completely different places. Okay. And then, then we have another question, which I actually also want to know the answer to. Uh, this is from Alberto and he asks, uh, first he says, Hey Nadi, congrats on your amazing visualization work. I'm interested to know if you have some kind of process to validate the sketches you do once you get an idea to develop it to confirm the audience understands them? Um, so what I generally do is, so I, I, I don't do user testing in that sense because I don't generally create visualizations that are um, embedded into some sort of organization and that are about like really important things. So I work on custom things that are usually used for like stories and magazines uh, for marketing, uh, really, really like one-offs. Uh, so in that sense, the way that I test if somebody gets it is I make the designs and then I send them to the client and then they can talk about it internally. Uh, they can share it with whomever they like. I will share it with some of the people that I know. Uh, and that's basically my pool of people that ask me and to, to have like, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? And if I really, really, really want to make sure that um, my design is somewhat understandable, I will let my dad see it. Did you say your dad? Yep, my dad. Okay. I've never, I've never dared to let it show to my mom because that will just, I will just be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have. Um, I have one question here that was sent: Is what steps are there in a typical client project? Uh, so generally I go through about three phases, which take completely different amounts of time. When a client first contacts me, um, I will, I, I need to understand their goals. So what is the main point that your visualization wants to convey? I'm not just plotting data that you have. I want to understand the why it could be a goal. It could be a lesson. Uh, and I also want to understand the data. So what variables do I have? How many of them are we talking about? A hundred, a hundred thousand. Um, uh, so once I have these two things, like the goal and the data, uh, I will go into the design phase. So I will sketch out designs again, just on, on plain, with plain pen and paper or my iPad Pro, but really just from hand, really rough designs. Um, if I have multiple of them, I will send them back in an email to the client. Uh, I used to do this in slide decks, but eventually I just send an e I just email and put in the, the, the sketches in there uh, because the sketches are so rough anyway. We discuss them, we might have a call about them, we pick one, they provide some feedback, and then I will go into the creation phase where I'm gonna try and put the data into that rough design as fast as possible to see if it works, to see if there's not some weird thing that makes it impossible for this data to fit into that design idea. If I see that that's working, I will then really just go into an almost endless phase of iterations. Uh, it's on the one hand to figure out the design, like what colors, any special effects, typography, layout, but also interactions, uh, resizing, just this, it slowly kind of comes together in a very iterative way. And, and during that process, I will keep the client appraised of like what the major changes are. Uh, and then it depends, is the final product static? Then I will take it back into Illustrator and turn it into images, add maybe legends and annotations. If it's meant to stay online, I will sort of wrap it up into a visual function that I can hand over to the client and then they can embed into their uh, systems. And that last part really takes like 80% of everything. Very cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we can go ahead and, and get a poll going. We had a last uh, we had a last quiz. I think you sent some questions for Nadi. I, I tried. All right, cool. Manuela, you want to go ahead and um, and launch the poll? Yes, the, yes. The quiz. I will go ahead and um, launch the poll. But there's one question above um, here. I'll launch it as we ask the question. So. If you can, all right, the poll, the poll is launched. You can go ahead and try answering. And in the meantime, we can go and get that question that we didn't get answered. 
Um, it says, how different are the creations you do for clients from other creative jobs you do just for fun? Um, I guess the biggest difference is usually the topic. So I really like very niche things that I'm a fan of, like Dragon Ball Z, Lord of the Rings movies, Cart Kept the Sakura manga. Uh, to, I, I haven't had a client that asked me to do anything about that. Although I came close because uh, two weeks ago, I, um, an, an article came out on Physics Today about the Hubble. So the Hubble Space Telescope has been in space for 30 years. And they asked me uh, a few months before that to make a visualization about all the observations that it's done in its 30 years. and that. That was basically my perfect client. Uh, it was basically a personal project where I was being paid to, to work on it. Uh, because of my astronomy background, I love working on anything still astronomy related. So um, in that case, so. And typically another uh, difference is that on my personal projects, I try and um, experiment with new ideas, like try and go crazy, try and use uh, like a, um, a way to shape the visualization that's not standard and see if people will um, think it's good or think it's not good uh, or try techniques like WebGL. Uh, I tried WebGL the first time in a personal project and then I could use it in a client project later on. So it's it's like, um, uh, yeah, I guess I say that, your, your playground in a way. Uh, that's something. Nice, nice. Did we get all the other questions? Um, let's see. I think we did. Okay. Cool, cool. Okay, so if you can, um, if you can go ahead and finish up the quiz. We have a few people. Did everyone? All right. 18. Cool. So do you want to go through the answers? Uh, sure. I, I, I closed it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so what has been the main guide for each project, the most important part to get started? It is indeed the topic. So I feel that people that are uh, coming into data visualization always feel like the data might be most important, but once you have an idea that you want to visualize, it's remarkable to see um, how you can find data that will support you to create a visualization around that topic. And the chart form is never the best thing to start with. So I really want to advise you to, if you have data, don't go to that chart form button in Excel to see what you're going to do. Try and think about like, what design would I use? Like if I, like I'm, I have my data, I know what I want to do. What design would I choose? And just not even looking at the available charts. Maybe draw out some ideas, draw a line chart, draw a bar chart, which of them is better at conveying the insights. Um, so yeah, good on that. Uh, and the second one is which of these are not part of the three pillars that we find most important in these projects. And so again, the, uh, the one that isn't part of it is the tool choice. Um, again, it's really more about the data, the sketching, get, getting the idea and coding, I guess maybe I should have said creating. Um, the tools, try and find a tool that best suits what you want to do or that you're most comfortable with. And it doesn't, you don't have to do everything in one tool. I do my data preparation in R, I do my visual programming in uh, with JavaScript in D3, but if it's static, I go back to a vector program such as Illustrator or Affinity Designer. Um, so it's like try and find, the, the tool is more of the secondary part. It's really about getting that idea um, together. 